Uh, my name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor here at International Church, and I'm really glad that you were with us this morning. If you don't know this about me, you will figure it out pretty quick. I really love sports. Like, I love watching sports. I will be watching the NBA Finals later. I even got up this past week at 5 in the morning so I could watch uh, the country I was born in, Austria, play the Euro Cup at 6 in the morning. Like, that's how sick I am um, with sports. I love watching. I love talking about it. I love playing sports. But you know what I don't love at all? Going to the gym. Can I get an amen? All right, there's a few of you. Like, I'll play soccer or basketball or football or volleyball all day long. But going to the gym and lifting weights and getting on a treadmill brings me zero joy whatsoever. And plus, they have, like, mirrors there, so I have to look at myself while I work on myself. Like, I don't need the mirrors. I know what I look like. That's why I'm there. I know I should work out more. I know I should go to the gym more than I do, more regularly, but I, I just don't want to. In this cartoon, I'm a bit like the uh, character on the right, if it comes up. On the left, there's a, a, a guy who's lifting weights, and he's wearing a t-shirt that says, no pain, no gain. That is true. And on the right, there's a character holding a burger and a Coke. It says, no pain, no pain. <laughs> well, that, that's also true. Right? I mean, no pain is, is, is no pain. And really, who wants pain? Nobody, right? I mean, if we all have the choice between pain or no pain, uh, I'll take no pain, thank you. When given the choice in life between suffering and pain or having it easy, lots of money, lots of family, lots of friends, no disappointments, no pain, no suffering, I, all of us are going to choose the latter. No one loves pain. No one signs up for torture. But no pain, no gain is true in the physical world. What if that's also true in the spiritual world? What if we approached life, not like the character on the right, doing everything possible to avoid pain, but maybe like the character on the left, recognizing that pain sucks, but it has an opportunity. Nobody wants pain, but pain can produce results that are desirable. So what might that be? What good could possibly come from pain? Why does God allow pain and suffering in our lives? Well, that's the question that uh, the first chapter of James in the New Testament attempts to answer. Let me read just the first verse by way of introduction. If you have a Bible or a Bible app on your smartphone, meet me in James chapter 1. And I'll just read verse 1, which is, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. How's it? That's the Hawaiian revised version. Um, so who is this James? Who's writing this? This is actually the half-brother of Jesus. Now, it sounds a little scandalous. Same mom, different dad. It's okay. Uh, James became a believer, a follower of his half-brother, uh, which had to be a little trippy for him to go through, shortly after Jesus ascended. And then James became the lead pastor of first church ever um, in Jerusalem. He was one of the main leaders in the first century of the church in Jerusalem. And he's writing this letter to the Christians who are scattered throughout Israel and likely the neighboring countries like Syria, which was just to the north, and possibly Egypt as well, kind of around that Mediterranean area. Now, the fascinating thing about the letter of James is it's almost certainly the oldest book. It was the first of the New Testament written before the Gospels and before anything else. James writes this letter that's recorded for us. And what's fascinating about that is James is writing to an audience that are encountering the gospel for the first time. I mean, this is 10 to 15 years after Jesus has died. His apostles have gone out. This is probably around the time Paul is coming on the scene, maybe even slightly before the apostle Paul. And he's writing to people who have believed in the gospel, who have heard the message that God is reconciling them to himself through Jesus Christ. And these people believe that message. And they're indwelled with the Spirit, and they're moved from the kingdom of sin into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of life and love. 
And they're kind of trying to figure out, what, how do you live in this new spiritual skin? How do we live as the new people of God, as those who are indwelled with God himself? We're following Jesus. Now, what does that mean for our lives? How does this faith work itself out? And that's really what James is about. So why are we studying it? Well, I think, first of all, it's in the Bible, and all of the Bible is profitable for us to study. But I think James, in particular right now, is a good fit. I think we live in a religiously pluralistic society that's pretty similar to first century Greco-Roman uh, empire. I think secondly, our church is in maybe in a slightly similar spot because we've spent the last couple months talking about the gospel. What is this good news and how do we live it out? Well, that's kind of maybe the question some of you were wondering is, all right, we've studied the gospel now. How do I put that into action? What difference does that make? So we might be in a similar place to where the audience of James is. And lastly, I think you're really going to enjoy James because he's just so practical. He just gets to the point. Uh, he, it's like he just kind of discovered Twitter. Like, first James, the chapter, is just so tweetable. He's just got like all these little tiny little nuggets that all kind of fit together. But it's really fascinating to look at. And then like chapters two through five, as we'll see, it's almost like he became a blogger instead and has maybe some larger chunks that we'll get to. So today, he answers the question that I think many have when they first encounter Christianity. Okay, we have this all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God. Then why is there pain? Why does God allow suffering, even in the lives of his people and his followers? It's a common question. It's a good question. It's an important question. And I think it's one that James is going to address for us. If you'll read with me in chapters two, or sorry, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Consider it pure joy when you're suffering. We're not off to a strong start here, are we? What does that mean? James, how can you consider it pure joy when your job is a drain, when you're struggling financially, when your spouse or a loved one is sick? James, how can you consider it pure joy when your children are wandering from the faith and painting your heart? James, how can you consider it pure joy when we can't have kids? James, how can we possibly consider it pure joy when we go through trials and sufferings of many kinds? Are Christians supposed to be masochists? Are we supposed to desire pain and just go, oh, this isn't pain, this is wonderful? Of course not. That would be both psychologically and spiritually very unhealthy. What James is saying is Christians, take a step back. When you are enduring suffering, take a step back because you know the bigger picture. You know that God can use suffering as an opportunity to grow you. You know that suffering is an opportunity for you to mature, for you to grow stronger. It's kind of like going to the gym. If you want bigger muscles, if you want to get stronger, you have to add weight to your physical fitness routine. Right? You, you either have to do more reps or you have to do more weight if you want to get stronger. Suffering is like adding weight to your spiritual fitness routine. It stretches your faith. It makes you trust God more in difficult circumstances. It's an opportunity for you to mature in Christ, for you to mature in your faith and for it to grow stronger. So suffering, James says, is a gift. Now let's be honest, it's a gift no one wants but it is a gift because it provides the opportunity to endure. And when we endure, James says, we become mature in Christ. I saw this play out this past week at the doctor's office. We took our, uh, our newborn, Audrey, in for her two-week checkup, and some immunizations were due. Now, an immunization is when they actually put a small dosage of a disease into my daughter's system 
so that she can develop antibodies against that disease should it present itself later in the more full-fledged effect. So Fiona took Audrey and put her down on the table that's cushioned thingy. And she's holding her legs in place while the doctor gets out two shots and stabs her in both legs. You've never seen a happier, more content baby become so angry and so rah! Mom and dad, seriously, you, did you see what she just, you let her poke? It, that's, she didn't say that, but you know, the tears in her eyes kind of expressed that. Mom, dad, you're gonna let me suffer like this? And while as a parent, no one likes to see their child suffer, no one wants their child to go through pain, we know the good that can be produced by that shot. We know the gain that can come through her pain, that ultimately, if she goes and endures this pain, her body will actually become stronger. Similarly, that's how our faith works. Audrey got the gift of suffering that she did not want, but enduring it matured her physically. When God sends us through trials and difficult times, it's a gift. It's a gift we don't want, but it provides the opportunity to endure and to persevere so that we can become mature in Christ. Now, the natural question that follows for me is, okay, if suffering is a gift and enduring it matures us in Christ, why do we Christians resist it so much? Why do we hate suffering so much? Why why do we all know people who have walked away from their faith because they went through tough times? I think that's the next section that James is going to address this. But I think the answer is that we lack wisdom. We lack insight into what God might be doing. Read with me uh, verse 5 through 12. James says, If any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. But blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. In this section, James saying, Put your spiritual goggles on. I want you to see the reality of what's actually going on. You might think there's just pain and nothing else, that there's no way this could possibly have a purpose, that there could be any gain that comes from a trial. But James is saying, put your spiritual goggles on. You know better. God can and does do good things through terrible situations. It's like if you have a cross stitch image. If I had one up here, you could, I could show you the one side where you kind of look at the back side of a cross stitch, if you ever have, and it looks chaotic, and it looks like a mess, and it looks like the person had no idea what she was doing, right? Like if you cross stitch, there's threads hanging out everywhere, tape on this, on that. It looks like a mess. You would conclude this person wasted their time. But if you flip that image over, you could actually see that she knew very much what she was doing. You could see the image that she had in mind and that she worked diligently to create. In life, you and I are the canvas, and God is poking and prodding and pulling threads, and yeah, sometimes it's really uncomfortable, and sometimes it really hurts. And when we look at it, we only see the backside of the image. We see the chaos. We feel the pain and we're tempted to conclude that God has no idea what he is doing. But we must trust that God does know what he's doing. We know that he has the other image. He knows that through these situations, he is imprinting Jesus Christ on your life. 
and on mine. He has the image. He knows what he's doing. So James is saying, hey, when you're looking at the backside and you're being tempted to doubt in those times, ask God for wisdom. Pray. Say, Jesus, would you show me what you're doing? Show me what I can't see. What, what is it you're developing in me? What characteristic are you trying to work on? In what way are you working through these experiences to develop maturity in me? Are you guaranteed to get an answer? No. Maybe he wants you to develop trust, and that might mean not giving you a full answer. But you can trust his character, that he is a God who gives generously. He gives of himself. You can look and ask for wisdom and insight. It's like Audrey, when she was at the doctor's, she, she didn't have the mental faculties to understand what was going on. I could have explained it to her, but it would have been useless. All she knew was fear and pain. And so similarly is the divide between us and God. We are finite human beings. We have finite minds that can only understand so much. But we have a God who is infinite, who understands and sees all. So simply because you and I can't possibly see what good could come from the pain doesn't mean that God doesn't. He might see things you and I don't see. He might be doing things that you and I can't understand. And then in, in verse 9, he starts talking about the rich and the poor. And it kind of feels a bit like James. That came out of left field. What are you talking about? Rich, poor, that rich is fading away? Well, I think he's addressing an example of suffering that most of his audience could have connected with. You see, about 90% of people in the Roman Empire in the first century are just barely eking out an existence. I mean, paycheck to paycheck sounds kind of nice to them. They'd like to have paychecks. It was a rough time. They didn't enjoy the wealth and the prosperity that we enjoy in the first world today. Poverty is a, was the most common form of suffering, even in the church. And so he's saying, hey, those of you who are poor, put your spiritual goggles on. Look at the big picture. You gotta understand that this testing, this suffering financially is, is temporary. It's not gonna last forever. There's a day coming when this world and all the riches are gonna be redeemed, are gonna be swallowed up. And what matters isn't ultimately whether you have spiritual riches or if you are spiritually poor, or sorry, matters if you're physically rich or physically poor. What matters is, do you have spiritual wealth? Do you have faith? If you're poor, he's saying, those of you who are poor but you have faith in Jesus, step back and see the big picture. Yeah, those who are rich have it nice now, but one day that flower is going to get burned up by the sun and it's going to wither. Don't put your hope in that stuff. Put your hope in Jesus Christ. And one day when he returns and inaugurates the new heavens and the new earth, you're going to be blessed with every spiritual blessing. You're going to have more wealth and prosperity and the crown of life that you could possibly imagine. Everything that is God's will be yours. So keep the big picture in mind. Understand that the suffering is temporary and understand that it is a gift. Now, for many of you here today, maybe you feel like you're in a similar spot. Maybe financially things are tight for you right now. I hope you take some solace from James' words. Even if that suffering were to last your entire life, it's temporary. This is not how you will feel forever. An end will come to the suffering, to the financial struggle. Now, that's not to say, and James isn't saying, that, well, being poor is therefore better than being rich, and give away all your money and you should go live on the street, or if you're living on the street, you should not try to get into a house. That's not what he's saying. We're clearly commanded to care for the poor. Those of us who have been given much, we need to be generous with these things. But he is saying, take the spiritual view. Understand the bigger picture of what God is doing. Suffering is a gift, and it's a temporary gift. And in the next section, it seems that James wants to clear up some potential confusion. James is saying, look, just because there's pain and suffering in your life does not mean that God is necessarily the source of it. Let's read on in verses 13 through 18. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. 
But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So James here says there's a difference between a test and a temptation. A test is a gift from God. Temptation comes from inside of you. A test has the goal for you to endure and for you to mature. But a temptation has the goal for you to sin and be dragged away. Now, what makes the difference between a test and a temptation? Our response. Our response to suffering ultimately shows whether or not the suffering will prove to be a test to be endured or a temptation to sin. Let me give an example. Maybe something that I think all of us, if we're truly honest, somewhere deep inside of us, we probably struggle with. And that's the issue of lust. Let's say an opportunity should arise for you and your spouse to be physically separated. Maybe one of you is on a business trip or off visiting family or in the hospital or deployed. Or if you're not married, this applies to you because you don't have a spouse right now. And God is putting you through this test, through this opportunity for you to endure. God wants you to keep your sexual desires within the bounds of marriage. Keep the gift right where it should be in a loving, committed marriage between a man and a woman. That's where sex should be enjoyed. So the opportunity for the test is to endure and to grow in maturity, to grow in self-control and in faithfulness to our spouse. But what happens is our own internal desires wake up and our sexual appetite demands to be fulfilled right now. And so we've taken this very same circumstances that God has brought about to test our endurance and for us to grow in maturity, and our own desires are hijacking it and turning this into a temptation to sin. Are you going to go to that website? Are you going to open that app? Are you going to go find that hidden magazine or that romance novel? Or are you just going to access one in your mind and lust after a man or woman who's not your husband or wife? And just like that, our response to the same situation, the test that God gifted us with to strengthen us, our desires have hijacked into a temptation to sin. And James is, considers it important enough that we understand that difference. Hey, if you are led into sin, you're going to have pain, and that pain is not a gaining pain. That's just a pain pain. Sin doesn't produce the godliness that God wants. Endurance produces godliness. So just because we're suffering, if you're facing a difficult time, don't add self-inflicted wounds on it by running off into temptation. It's, that's just friendly fire. You're just going to make it harder. To, and sin is so insidious. It makes you think that the temptation is actually going to give you what you want. It's going to end the suffering when really it just hijacks it. And you don't get the endurance and the benefits of perseverance that keeping would have given you. So I don't know where you're here today, where you're at. I think all of us are always going to be struggling with something. Maybe some of you have bigger things. Um, Maybe some of you would say right now, there's not much going on that's difficult. Awesome. You know, you're not in the spiritual gym right now. Enjoy it. But just know that that time is coming. That time is coming. It, you'll be back there. There will be some extra resistance being added, some spiritual weight. And I am praying for you and for me that we endure. That we would not allow ourselves to get hijacked by our own internal desires, but we would endure, trusting that God is developing us in maturity and in Christ. So there's two things, either right now or for that time, that I hope you take away. One is just remember that suffering is a gift. It's a gift. God does his best work in and through people through suffering. 
You can take this book from beginning to end. God is using broken people and messed up situations to bring about good. And even at the very center of this book, at the very center of history, the culmination of all of God's activity was the suffering and the death of God the Son on the cross. That is how redemption is brought about for you and me. We are saved because someone else suffered and took the pain in our place that was ours. So consider, friends, if God does his greatest work in and through suffering and he did not spare his own son, maybe it's true that he's going to do his best work in your life and in my life through suffering. Perhaps, as painful as it is, suffering is a gift. And we should expect it, and we should receive it. The Apostle Paul says something similar. In Acts chapter 14, there's a small story that the uh, author Luke records for us. Paul and his buddy Barnabas are out on a mission, and they come back. In uh, Acts 14, verse 21, it says... Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. They were strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. That phrase, remain true, is to endure or to persevere in the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. How'd that be for a church tagline? International church. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Like, ain't nobody going to sign up for that, right? Try to invite your friends to that. Living in this world, you're going to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Come on in. Here's some coffee. We will go through hardships. It has purpose. Suffering has a purpose. The prosperity gospel that communicates a message to people that the most faithful are the ones who have all the blessings or even interpret blessings as health, wealth, and happiness are lying to you. We do not get that message from scripture. God does not promise health, wealth, and happiness, just the opposite. Through many hardships, we will enter the kingdom of God. No pain, no gain. It's a hard truth, but it is a truth. It's uncomfortable. But suffering is not something we should expect to be spared from. It's something we should expect and receive as a gift, as an opportunity to endure. Suffering proves, can show, can demonstrate whether or not our faith is genuine or real. Now, Greek scholars point out that the word that James uses for temptation and for testing is actually the same. It's the Greek word dokimion. That comes from the Greek word dakumas. Now, this was an important and regular word that you would encounter in everyday life in Greco-Roman culture. It was very important when you went shopping. Because if you're at the marketplace, you'd be picking up pottery, let's say, and you're looking, that's a nice piece of pottery. The very first thing you're going to do is you're going to pick up that piece of pottery and you're going to look on the bottom. Oh, nope, I'm going to set that one down. I'm going to come over here and pick up this one. Oh, this one might work. You see, when they took pottery and they sold it at the marketplace, they would have somebody test the pottery. It would go through an intense heat. It would be put through the flames. And if it came through unscathed, it got stamped, dakumas, meaning genuine or real. That word dakumas and dokimion actually have a very positive connotation You want pottery that's been stamped dakumas. James is saying you want a faith that's been stamped dakumas. And God wants your faith to be stamped dakumas. He wants to reveal your faith as genuine and true and real. God doesn't put you through tests because he's trying to trip you up or ruin your life. He puts you through tests because he loves you and he wants you to see that your faith is genuine. He wants to stamp your faith, dakumas. He wants to find you faithful. But in order to stamp you as such, your faith must be put through the flames. 
It must from time to time endure hardship and endure suffering in order for your strength to increase, in order for your faith to grow and to become more mature. So the one thing, the first thing I want you to remember is suffering is a gift. Endure it because it brings about maturity in Christ. The second thing I want you to know about the testing of God and suffering is this. You don't have to be afraid of it because Jesus has already passed the ultimate test for you. That's the good news of the gospel. Our relationship with God is never dependent on our works, on our efforts. We are fully known and fully accepted by God because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you and me. When we put our faith in him, we are putting him and he is putting us. When God looks at Christ, he sees you. And when he looks at you, he sees Christ. And Jesus came and took the test of life. He got put through all the pop quizzes. He took the final exam and he got an A+. And when you put your faith in him, God takes his grade and he puts it on your final exam. You already have an A plus in life. Your final grade is etched into the book of life. If you've put your faith alone in Christ alone, you don't have to be afraid of tests. Passing a test does not make God happier with you. And failing a test does not make God mad at you. God doesn't test you for him. He knows where your faith is at. God knows every test you're going to pass and fail. He knows where you're at. God doesn't test you because he wants something from you. God tests you because he wants something for you. The class has already been passed, but he's still going to put you through the class. You're going to have some assigned reading. He's going to put you through some tests. Why? Because he wants to reveal the progress and the knowledge to you. God knows where your knowledge is at. He knows where your faith is at, but he wants you to know it. Imagine like a math test. A math test is designed to test your math knowledge. Do you know how to calculate the circumference of a circle? Of course not. You forgot. So have I. But it's not until we take that math test that asks us to calculate the circumference of a circle that it will, our knowledge or lack of knowledge becomes clear. A test reveals our knowledge to you and to your professor. Now we have a God, however, who's all-knowing. So the test means nothing to him in the sense of revealing knowledge, but it means everything to us. The tests of God, the suffering of God, is God holding up a mirror to you in your faith, going, this is where you're at. We don't have to kid ourselves. God's not mad at you or disappointed in you. He knows where you're at. He loves you, and he loves you so much, he doesn't want you to stay here. While there's pain involved in growing and maturing, becoming like Christ is always better than staying the way we are. And his tests, suffering, are the tools he uses to grow us and mature us. But remember that God is for you. He's always for you. The testing is because he loves you. It's a gift he gives his children so that our faith can mature, so our faith can endure. So if you're going through a tough time, keep going. Not saying it's easy. In fact, I think that's hard. And the big reason why it's hard is so it can be stretching for us and we can learn to rely on God more and also we can learn to rely on each other more. So if there's something going on in your life that maybe other people don't know about, reach out. Reach out to a friend here in church or let the staff know. We pastors would love to care for you and to walk that journey with you. Because God loves you and is testing and suffering our gifts, opportunities to endure. So let's endure. Let's not let ourselves get dragged away by our own desires. Let's follow what God wants us to do so that we may be mature and complete in Jesus Christ, not lacking anything. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your love for us. God, a love that loves us as we are, but does not leave us as we are. Father, I pray that you would give us spiritual insight. We don't have wisdom, we lack it, so we ask you for it. 
Lord, if there's people here who are going through a real rough patch right now, I pray that you would give them some insight as to what you're doing. Would you give them courage to keep going, to endure? God, would you reveal to them how you're using this to strengthen their faith, to strengthen their walk with you? God, may you give us eyes to see as well our friends and family who are around us that are going through tough times. May we find words of encouragement and grace and love that you have for us. Thank you that you've forgiven us of all things because of Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.